Good evening, everyone. My name is Evan Maldonado. I'm the Community Engagement Manager for the All of Us Research Program at the Medical College of Wisconsin. We want to welcome everyone to tonight's presentation, which is sponsored by the All of Us Research Program. The All of Us Research Program is a historic effort to collect and study data from 1 million or more people living in the U.S. The goal is to the goal of the program is to is better health for all of us and advancing precision and personalized medicine through research. A couple of housekeeping rules right before we start. First of all, uh, we want to welcome our speaker, and tonight we'll be reviewing over heart disease. There will be a question and answer session towards the end. So if at any time you have a question, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box or hold them until the Q&A section. Uh, Taquanda Gilbert will be monitoring the chat, so we'll keep an eye on things as we go through. This presentation is being recorded, and the recording will be made available on social media, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and we'll remind you at the end again. You have been muted by the host, so please alert the host if you want to be unmuted by putting your request in the chat. We will do a drawing at the end for $25 at the end of this presentation. And we'll give you more instructions about that. Tonight's presenter is Ms. Allison Rennenbaum, who is community community engagement nurse coordinator for Freighter and the National and the Medical College of Wisconsin. I'm so sorry. Allison, it's all yes. yours. Thank you, Edwin. Tonight we're going to be discussing the basics of heart disease and ways to keep your heart healthy. Next slide, please, Edwin. So first, let's talk about what is heart disease. The term heart disease refers to several types of heart condition, which can include things like congenital heart defects or a structural problem with a baby's heart when it's born, hypertension, which is high or uncontrolled blood pressure, strokes, uh, which is the blockage of blood flow to an area of your brain or bleeding in your brain that causes part of the brain tissue to die, and heart failure, which is a serious condition that occurs when the body's heart is not strong enough to pump enough blood to meet the body's needs. It doesn't mean that the heart has stopped working, but instead it means that the heart muscle is just too weak to pump the blood. It's often called congestive heart failure because fluid actually builds up in the person's uh, lungs, liver, legs, and feet. And the only cure for heart failure is a heart transplant, but it can be managed with medications and certain medical procedures. Coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis is actually the most common type of heart disease in the United States. It causes a decreased blood flow to the heart, which we're going to talk about more in just a few minutes. Next slide, please. I think. So why is heart disease so important? Well, heart disease is actually the leading cause of death in the United States, only followed by cancer. About one in every four or every five heart attacks is actually silent, meaning that the damage is done to your heart, but the person is not aware of it. So even if you have no symptoms, you could still be at risk for heart disease. And with COVID, as we all are currently living in our COVID pandemic, Heart disease actually increases your risk of severe illness and death from COVID-19. Researchers recently found that individuals with high levels of bad cholesterol were at an increased risk of death and dying. So next, we're going to talk a little more about two of the major consequences of heart disease, and then we'll dig into, you know, more of those risk factors and things you can do to prevent it. Next slide, Edwin. So a heart attack or a myocardial infarction, as we call it in the medical field, is what occurs when blood flow to an area of your heart gets blocked. And most heart attacks are caused by a blood clot that blocks one of the coronary arteries or those little red lines that you see on the heart picture. And what those coronary arteries do is bring oxygen and blood into the heart. But if the blood flow gets blocked, the heart then gets starved of oxygen and it causes heart cells to die. And when heart cells begin to die, time becomes extremely important. 
because the longer that the heart tissue goes without any oxygen, the further that damage actually spreads. Treatment for a heart attack can include surgery to open up the blocked area with a balloon or a stent, or we can reroute the blood flow around the blockage. And if you look at the picture on the bottom of the slide, you can see an image of what it looks like when we place a stent into an artery to open that blockage back up. Next slide, please. A stroke is also caused by a lack of blood supply, but this is to the brain and it results in death of the brain tissue. There are two types of strokes. There's a hemorrhagic stroke, which occurs when a blood vessel ruptures or explodes, <laughs> and there's bleeding actually inside of the brain, or an ischemic stroke, which is caused by a blood clot or blockage to an artery, much like a heart attack. Now with a stroke, the things that we are most um, concerned about and watch out for when we're thinking someone may have had one is changes to their um, physical appearance. So is one side of their face drooping? Um, are they able only able to pick up one arm when we put their arm straight out? Does one just drop to their side? Uh, are they slurring their words? And we always want anytime when you notice some, some, some major medical condition, you wanna know what time it occurs and calling for help, calling 911, is extremely important. The sooner you do it, the sooner the person can get the, the care that they need. Next slide, please. Heart disease, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So heart disease risk factors. We've discussed the scary outcomes of heart disease. So now I wanna look a little closer at the risk factors. There are a lot of things that increase a person's risk of developing heart disease. And we're going to look at each one of them, and then we'll talk about some of them a lot more in depth. So alcohol intake. Drinking too much alcohol can actually raise your blood pressure, increase your cholesterol levels, which can contribute to that plaque buildup inside your arteries. <clears throat> Having an unhealthy diet um, that's high in fat, sugar, um, can, um, can also contribute to developing atherosclerosis or that clogging of the arteries as well as having too much salt in, a, in your diet, which can raise your blood pressure. Living what we call a sedentary lifestyle, or yeah, honestly, most desk jobs, unfortunately, can also lead to obesity through that lack of exercise, and it can raise your cholesterol and your blood pressure as well. Being overweight increases your risk through uh, other risk factors, generally like heart disease, uh, I'm sorry, like high cholesterol, diabetes, and high blood pressure. A lot of people forget that hygiene is important in all health. So if we're not taking good care of our overall hygiene, like not brushing our teeth every day, twice a day, that can contribute to heart disease through infections that can occur in your mouth and then um, travel through your bloodstream and cause damage to your heart. Smoking, um, as most people already know, is not good for you, right? <laughs> That's kind of the basic health message that we send. But smokers are actually more likely to develop atherosclerosis or the clogging of the arteries and have heart attacks. That's because the carbon monoxide that they're breathing in when they're smoking is damaging the lining of their blood vessels while the nicotine is raising their blood pressure. Being around other people who smoke can also increase your risk of developing heart disease through the exposure of the secondhand smoke. Again, we live in the COVID-19 pandemic, so everyone's probably been experiencing a little bit more stress than lately, but excessive and prolonged stress contributes to long-term illnesses like high blood pressure. So it's really important to consider how we can control our stress because it's really, it's easy to use, um, to make certain behavior and lifestyle choices that could help contribute to our risk of heart disease, like drinking more alcohol, or smoking when we feel stressed. And we're gonna talk about ways to reduce your stress later on this evening. Looking at things we can't change. So as we get older, your heart muscle can get weaker, it can get thicker, your arteries can get damaged, and that's just something we can't fix over time. So we really wanna focus in on those lifestyle changes that we can control because we can't 
change how old we are. We can't change if we're a man or a woman, right? Um, but if we know we have certain risk factors, we can do our best to help keep them in check. Men are actually at higher risk of having a heart attack than women. However, um, women's risk actually increases after, after menopause. Thankfully, though, it's still a little lower than men's. But um, either way, men are more at risk for heart disease. And uh, that's why we really keep a close eye on our guys. For race, uh, certain races have been shown to have higher heart disease. And so we do tend to screen and, and be more cognizant of that in those populations. Genetics, which it's part of why we're here, right? Through all of us, there's certain conditions that um, can be inherited that actually affect your heart. So certain family histories, things like heart disease, um, Marfan syndrome, um, there's, so, there's so many different inherited conditions that can cause uh, heart, can, heart issues. But if one of both of your parents had heart disease and were diagnosed before they were 55 for your father or before age 65 for your mom, um, we actually find that that increases your risk of developing heart disease. So it's really important for you to know your family history and then to share that with your doctor so we can help ensure that we are doing everything we can to reduce your risks. For high blood pressure, um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But what happens is your the pressure inside of your arteries kind of increase it increases, and if it gets too high, it actually causes damage and leads to the thickening and hardening up of your blood vessels. Diabetes, um, even when blood sugar levels are under control, if you have diabetes, your risk of heart disease and stroke is still uh, much higher than that of the general population. And so we really do our best for our people who have diabetes to try to keep that controlled. And lastly, cholesterol. Uh, really, that pertains to our diets, right? So yes, our bodies make cholesterol, but when you eat more cholesterol than your body can use, it ends up building up in your arteries and thickening up those walls and causing them to narrow and reducing that blood flow to your heart and to other organs. Next slide, please. So, like I said, looking at cholesterol, where does it come from? Well, cholesterol is this waxy substance that's found throughout our bodies. And <laughs> We often give cholesterol a bad rap, but it's actually quite critical to your body. Your body produces cholesterol and it's found in all the cells of our body. We need it to function normally to make things like vitamin D and testosterone and cortisol, which is the hormone we produce when we're under stress. Because cholesterol production in our bodies is really highly regulated, most of our excess cholesterol comes from our diet. Next slide, please. There are two lipoproteins or fat proteins that make up cholesterol. They're known as LDL, low density lipo lipoprotein, and HDL, high density lipoprotein. Now, how do you remember which one's which? Well, LDL, LDL is what we call the bad cholesterol or the excess cholesterol that your body can't use. And how, um, what happens when we have LDL is the cholesterol gets transported through your bloodstream and then stored in the tissues and the blood vessel walls, which as you can imagine, is not good. And I'll show you why in a moment, but we really wanna keep that number low because we don't wanna be storing extra stuff that we don't need. HDL on the other hand is what we call the good cholesterol because it takes all that extra cholesterol out of our arteries and sends it over to our liver to get it out of our body. And so we wanna keep that number high because we want things to be cleaned out and you know, even and balanced. So cholesterol is really all about balance. I mean, it's just like eating and exercise, intake and output, right? Next slide, please. So we talked about extra cholesterol just a little bit. Where does the extra cholesterol go? Well, in ideal situation, the, the bad cholesterol gets dropped off, would all get cleaned up by that HDL good cholesterol. But 
unfortunately, that's generally often not the case. So the LDL cholesterol that gets dropped off, <clears throat> we have too much of it, and so it doesn't get taken away. So it causes these things called plaques to build up, which is that yellow substance you see that's kind of narrowing the artery there. <clears throat> and what it does is those plaques form and they reduce the ability for the blood to flow through your arteries and get to your organs, which also reduces the amount of oxygen that's getting to your organs. That is what we call atherosclerosis or the narrowing of your arteries. Next slide. So atherosclerosis, it sounds kind of scary, but it's not a big deal, right? Sadly, no, <laughs> it is concerning. Just like the pipes inside your home, which we never want to get clogged, uh, we don't want our arteries to get clogged because that can lead to major problems. So how do we find out if there's a problem? Well, we check your cholesterol levels. And on this chart, you can see that as the LDL cholesterol level rises up, the risk for heart disease also rises. So we're always looking at that to see where you're at and what your relative risk is related to your numbers. Remember, the cholesterol deposits are narrowing those arteries and making it harder for the blood to flow through. So if a small blood clot forms or a piece of that plaque breaks off, it can block the blood flow completely and cause a heart attack, a stroke, or even death. Next slide, please. Now we understand a little about cholesterol and how that affects your body, we're gonna look at the blood pressure. Blood pressure is a measurement of how hard the heart is working to pump the blood around your body. And the results are made up of two numbers. The top number, which is your systolic pressure, is a reading of the, <laughs> excuse me, a reading that indicates the pressure in your arteries when your heart squeezes to beat. And then that bottom number is the diastolic pressure which shows the pressure in your arteries when it's relaxed. <clears throat> and so when what we get concerned about when you have high blood pressure, uncontrolled blood pressure, is that that extra pressure really damages the artery walls and eventually um, it damages your organs. And so the longer it goes uncontrolled, the more damage it's doing to your body, which like, like I said, can eventually lead to a heart attack or a stroke. So ideally, we want patients to be, for the top number, less than 120, and for the bottom number, less than 80. So when you go to your doctor and they check your blood pressure, they say, it's 118 over 70. That's great. Now, if we tell you it's 156 over 92, it's not so great. We got some work to do, right? So just being cognizant of what those numbers mean, um, you can see on this little chart here, there's different stages that we would be more concerned about where your blood pressure reading is. Again, if it's just one time where it's 135 over 80, we may not be as concerned as if it's consistently that elevated. So it's, it's all about being with your, checking in with your doctor, seeing what your normal is, and working through that, which we'll, we'll talk through more in a little while. Now, unfortunately, one more thing about blood pressure, there is no symptoms of high blood pressure. So it's really important that we check your blood pressure regularly. Um, thank you, Edwin. So <laughs> we've got a good idea of the different types of heart disease and what symptoms we need to look out for. I'm sorry, <laughs> of what risk factors um, play into it. But now we're going to look at what symptoms we need to watch out for and be concerned about. So the symptoms you see here on the screen are things that could happen when you're resting or also when you're doing regular, regular activities, like doing the dishes, walking the dog, driving the car. Um, <clears throat> so activity intolerance, what we mean by that is you're not able to do things you normally would do. So if you could use, we used to be able to walk up the stairs without being out of breath. And now, you know, you get to the top of the steps and you're huffing and puffing. We, we want you to talk to your doctor about that. Okay, we, we need to know so we can try to figure out what's going on. Chest pain um, can be dull 
heavy or sharp um, and discomfort, but we want to make sure it's not related to food. <laughs> it gets a little tricky because nausea or I'm sorry, um, indigestion can be a sign of a heart attack in women, but generally if you have some sort of chest pain and you didn't just eat and you have no reason to think it's from heartburn, we need to know about it. That's concerning, okay? Um, could also be an unexplained pain that's in your, your neck or your jaw um, or in your throat, maybe your upper belly or in your back um, that you just can't think of a reason why that's hurting. That's always a good time to talk to your doctor, okay? When you're fatigued or you become easily tired for no reason, it's another good reason for you to check in. Um, anytime you have new or unexplained swelling of an area of your body, like your feet, your ankles, your arms, always a good idea. Please come see us so we can figure out what's happening. Uh, irregular heartbeat is a feeling of like a fluttering or a really strong beating in your chest. We call that palpitations. And that can be a symptom of a number of things. So we definitely want to be able to check that out if you're experiencing that. Shortness of breath or difficulty breathing is always concerning. So please, if you experience these symptoms, contact your doctor or call 911. Okay. Next slide. Now we're going to talk about the danger zone, as I call it. So, like we said, sometimes heart disease can be silent until an emergency occurs. So what we just talked about are symptoms. Those are things you can obviously feel uh, or see if it's your partner that you know you need to do something about. But how do we know when it's like the scary time where you need to call 911, right? Um, heart attack, which is that chest pain or discomfort, usually in the upper back, uh, could be neck pain. You might have some indigestion or heartburn. You might feel like you're going to throw up be really tired, um, you're just not right. Something is wrong, okay? Women are more likely to experience nausea and that unexplained tiredness, maybe jaw pain, than a man, um, which we're gonna look a little closer at in the next slide, but there are certain differences between men and women and how they experience these conditions. An arrhythmia, which is uh, an irregular heartbeat, is uh, excuse me, is that fluttery feeling in your chest, right? So that's something that we always are concerned about. And heart failure, that shortness of breath, that tiredness, swelling of your ankles, your feet, your belly. If you or your loved one are experiencing these kinds of symptoms that you see here, please call 911. We need to get them some help, okay? Next slide, please. So like I said, remember, men and women often have different symptoms of a heart attack. So in a woman, you're going to see, you might see more of that nausea, lightheaded, abnormally tired. You, she, a woman might not have central chest pain where she feels like an elephant is sitting on her chest. She could, but she may not. And so thinking through when you're, all of a sudden, you just don't, feel like yourself, you know, you, you feel lightheaded, you feel out of it, you feel like you're going to throw up, but you don't, you can't think of any reason why. Something's wrong. So please go see a medical provider. Okay. Next slide, please. All right. Treatments for heart disease. So treatment recommendations for controlling heart disease. Again, there's various types are different from person to person, and they always need to be discussed with your doctor. There are some common treatments for heart disease that could be prescribed, which include things like lifestyle modifications, which we're going to go through. It might be prescription medications, which could lower blood pressure, lower your cholesterol, or take some of the extra fluid out of your body. Uh, could be surgery, like a cardiac catheterization, uh, a stent, or a balloon where we go in and open up those arteries, or things like precision medicine, like all of us, right? Did you guys know that your genes 
or the cells that make up your body can help guide doctors when selecting the best treatments and preventative strategies for you. So we're gonna look at this graphic on the bottom of the slide to see an example of how this works for heart disease. High cholesterol can actually be linked to genetics for about one out of every 200 people. So when you develop, if you develop high cholesterol, we can use genetic testing to find out um, if it runs in your family. And uh, <clears throat> looking at your genome, we can then determine what treatment options might work best for you. The beauty of this is that it takes that trial and error guesswork out and leads to saf safer, safer and faster treatment than the old way we used to do things. So it's really fascinating to see how we can use precision medicine to target those treatments and get people healthier faster. Next slide. So let's put this all together and see what you can do to prevent heart disease. We're gonna go over seven steps you can take, and then we'll talk about, you know, what do you think you're gonna use? Next slide. So first, first and foremost, always, we'd love to hear that you see your doctor regularly. I know <laughs> there's a lot of men out there that don't go to their doctor visits regularly. There's a lot of women that don't either. Um, but the more often that you see your doctor on that annual basis, the more they know you, and they're able to tell you, and it's kind of like your family, your family that you see on a regular basis, they know when something's wrong versus your family you never see, right? They know you and they know how to pick up on things that might be out of your everyday normal, okay? When you see your doctor, discuss things like, can I get my cholesterol checked? Do I need to have my blood sugar checked? Um, and learn what the numbers are that they're giving you, okay? And we're gonna look at a lot of those numbers on the next slide. Listen carefully to what they have to say. Doesn't mean that we, we always wanna hear what our doctors have to say, but when they give us that information, it's in our best interest, okay? Um, they might be able to give you really great recommendations on what changes might work for you and what things might not be the best option. Um, they'll help you develop that realistic plan for total health and wellness so that we can get you to your best place. Next slide. So knowing your numbers, as you work towards improving your health, it's really important to understand what numbers are normal for you. LDL cholesterol, like we talked about, is that bad cholesterol. And we the having the high level of LDL cholesterol means there's a higher risk for you to have heart disease. So ideally, we want that number to be less than 160. For your blood pressure, like we looked at earlier, uh, we want that to be less than 120 on the top and less than 80 on the bottom without medication. Now, if you're on medication, that's going to be determined by your doctor and you together. For blood sugar, um, blood sugar is really just that sugar that is in your body. Um, it comes from digestion where um, simple starches and carbohydrates get broken down into sugar, and then your body uses that sugar. But um, if you have a high sugar level, a high level of glucose, as we call it, that can indicate diabetes. So ideally, we wanna keep that blood sugar level less than 100 milligrams per deciliter when we check it on your finger, okay? Obesity um, or being overweight can be indicated through your body mass index, which is that measurement of body fat based off your height and your weight, which applies both to men and women. So the higher your body mass index is, the greater your risk for obesity and heart problems and health problems overall. So we wanna see that number hopefully less than 25. And then exercise. So for optimal health, we, we, like, we would like people to exercise at least 150 minutes of what we call moderate intensity or 75 minutes a week of vigorous intensity or a combination between the two. And we're gonna look at that more um, in just a moment. Next slide. 
Ah, uh, yes. Tobacco and alcohol. Smoking is the number one modifiable risk factor for heart disease. And tobacco use is actually the primary cause of heart attacks in patients younger than 50. So to reduce your risk, quit smoking, quit vaping, don't chew tobacco, better yet, don't start. Um, also, try to avoid exposure to secondhand smoke when you can. I'm not going to minimize it. If you have been smoking for a long time, quitting a nicotine habit is not easy. There is help and support available, so please talk to your doctor, reach out to your family, and you know get that support you need to quit. We're here to help you. I know we live in Wisconsin. Drinking is part of our culture, but drinking large amounts of alcohol can significantly raise your blood pressure. Men should not be drinking more than two drinks per day, and women should not have more than one drink per day. Ideally, you're not drinking one drink per day, seven days out of the week, but at a minimum, you know, keeping it under that two drinks for men, one drink for women. Next slide. So modern intensity activities versus vigorous intensity activities. We know regular exercise is good for you. It helps keep your cholesterol levels lower, your blood sugar controlled, keeps your weight down and it can actually lower your blood pressure. Less weight means less work for your heart. So what we wanna do is start small and work our way up, but it's really all about time and intensity. So when we say we want you to do 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity activities, we mean we wanna see you walk, like speed walking, right? Quickly walking, doing, maybe some dancing, general gardening, um, moderate type of activities. And then for the vigorous activity, which is 75 minutes a week, it's things that really get your heart pumping, okay? So <laughs> speed walking, jogging, running, uh, swimming laps, jumping rope, <laughs> hiking uphill, or just walking with a really heavy backpack will do it. <laughs> you know, back when students carried a bunch of textbooks, we were doing great on that vigorous intensity activity. Um, one thing of note for tennis that is on both lists, one um, on the moderate activity, if you're playing tennis with two people, you're not working as hard as if you're playing tennis all by yourself because you're running all over the court. So that one can get confusing, but overall, just remember if your heart's pumping really hard, that's a vigorous activity um, and that'll help, help your uh, heart get a little bit healthier. So you want to be more um, active, but you work at a desk. For every 20 minutes of sitting, try to stand for eight minutes and move around for two. Um, just try little things. I'm not saying you got to run the marathon next week. Just take those little steps to make yourself healthier. And if you're ever unsure about what exercises are safe for you, talk to your doctor. That's what they're there for. Okay. Next slide. Eating healthy, eating a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables and whole grains can help reduce your heart disease risk. So <clears throat> to change your diet, we wanna see people increase their fruits and veggies, whole grains, lean proteins like fish, chicken, and eat foods that are really high in fiber, but low in those saturated and trans fats um, to help prevent the, the cholesterol, the high cholesterol, that LDL cholesterol from um, becoming an issue. We also want to keep an eye on the amount of salt we're using. Unfortunately, in our diets, there's a ton of added salt. So we look at canned vegetables. Um, so it is never a good example, but um, chips, really any processed food has quite a bit of salt, which can really raise your blood pressure. So by reducing the amount of added salt, we're, do, we're helping our bodies be healthier. If you need the flavor, Mrs. Dash is always a good an option, but there's, there's tons of seasonings out there that can help reduce um, the amount of salt that you add. Limiting sugary things can also reduce your risk of diabetes and 
keep your blood sugar under control. So, like I said earlier, always talk to your doctor if you aren't sure what's right for you. If you are thinking of trying a new diet, but you're not sure that your doctor is there to help answer those questions. Remember, living healthy is a marathon. It's not a race. Start with something simple. Um, if you're going to make a change to your diet, start maybe by adding a, adding vegetables to your plate at most meals. Replace your soda with flavored water. Um, I'll try to avoid processed foods and fast foods. You know, start with one thing. And then once that starts working, start the next. Okay. Next slide. Researchers have found that there can be a link between gum disease and heart disease. So people um, who have periodontal disease or gum disease are actually twice as likely to have heart disease. So to avoid these complications, brush your teeth twice a day, floss once a day, and remember, <laughs> please see your dentist. Usually it's every six months, depending on your, your personal condition, it may be more frequently, but just making sure that we're taking those basic steps to keep ourselves healthy. Next slide. So stress. Stress is everywhere. <laughs> we, we all experience it in different ways. Um, and as I said, you know, with COVID, things are not easy, but to lower your stress level and find healthy ways to cope can actually help lower your blood pressure. And so doing simple breathing exercises is just one example. Um, meditating, yoga, just to walk outside, you know, just to change a pace, right? Um, so things that are easily squeezed into your busy schedule because it has to work for, for each person. It has to work for you. So what I wanna do is try and exercise together with everyone called four by four breathing. And this is an exercise you can do while you wash your hands, while you make your coffee or do the dishes. It's quick, it's easy, and you don't need any extra tools to do this, okay? So sitting in a very comfortable position, um, you can put your hands on your knees, put your hands at your side, whatever is comfortable for you. Try to keep your shoulders relaxed. Your eyes can be open or closed, whichever is more comfortable. Over four seconds, we're gonna breathe in through your nose. Filling your lungs up from the bottom and then hold your breath for four seconds. And then slowly exhale through your nose. As you count to four, you're gonna squeeze those muscles in your belly. And at the end of that breath, pause for another four seconds. and then repeat. And you can do this as many times as you need to feel more centered, more relaxed. It's just a simple mindful breathing exercise. Um, you can try doing this in real life. You know, our commutes can be really stressful, um, whether it's, you know, a long day at the office, construction, running late, whatever it might be, doing something simple like breathing can really help. So just taking a few more deep breaths before you leave your parking spot or the driveway, or if you're riding the bus, every time the bus stops at, at a new stop location, taking a mindful breath, it's easy little things that you can bring into your life. Next slide. So we talked about a lot. And what I wanna challenge everybody to uh, think about is what change will you make? I don't want you to make them all at once because <laughs> that probably won't set you up for success. Choose one or two. What risk factor do you want to work on improving first? Maybe it's quitting smoking. Maybe it's starting a small exercise routine. Cutting out sugary beverages, scheduling your dentist appointment, um, you know, scheduling your annual physical. An easy way to remember is to schedule it around your birthday every year or make the phone call on your birthday. Take your medications as prescribed. Maybe that's a new thing you're going to try to do consistently, okay? Um, there are so many things that everyone can try to do. And just start simple. Again, it's a marathon, 
not a race. Next slide. All right, well, thank you all. I'll pass it back over to Edwin. Thank you, Allison. Thank you for that information. It's great. Uh, lost me here for a minute because I started doing the breathing exercise <laughs> while I was falling asleep, but um, it does work. I have used it before, so I highly recommend it to others. Uh, so please use it um, because it's going to help you in so many different ways. Um, I'm going to move on here. Uh, at this moment, if anybody has any questions, uh, please type it into your chat or ask that your microphone will be unmuted. Therefore, you can feel free to ask questions at any time now. So again, if we don't get to all the questions, uh, we will follow up with you individually. And again, this meeting is being recorded and all your shared and will be shared as a resource. So you will see this again. And if you go to our website and we'll give you the information at the end, you'll be able to see the presentation one more time. So first question I have for you, Allison. Mm -hmm. um, do women experience, and you might have answered this, but do women experience different symptoms or risks than men would, and why? That's a great question, I mean, um, So yes, women do experience different symptoms than men um, in regards to heart attacks. Specifically, um, there is some changes that go in, in line with our hormones. So women, obviously, we have a little more estrogen than our male counterparts. And so as we go through changes, um, such as menopause, our bodies do change and our risk factors then change as well. So we do see that um, in women. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, let's say we do find someone who's suffering from a heart attack. Uh, mm -hmm. What are some of the things that we can do to assist at that moment? Great question. That is extremely, extremely important to know. So, if you are with someone and you suspect that they are experiencing a heart attack, please, please call 911. If you can, note the time, keep a very close eye on that person and listen to what that 911 operator is telling you to do, because they're gonna go through specific checks that they want you to make with that person and things that they might want you to give them or not give them until help arrives. And so listening very closely and doing everything you can to be present is critical for the person who's going through those symptoms. All right, thank you. Um, another question that came in here is, um, why does heart disease affect specific demographic groups differently? That is an excellent question. Um, well, I don't know all of the scientific details behind it. I can say that you know, some of that can be related to our genetics. Um, some of that can be related to social determinants of health. So based on where we live, where we work, um, how our lives are structured. Um, and some of that can be related to access to medical care, which again is part of those social um, health factors. but. I don't know the exact um, connection between the, the heart disease and race for each demographic, <laughs> unfortunately, off the top of my head. That one we may need to follow back up with you on. I apologize. Oh, no problem. Um, what, um, why is time so important if you're with someone who's suffering from a stroke? What is the importance of time? Excellent question. So in medicine, we say time is tissue. So time is brain tissue. And so when someone is having a stroke, the longer it takes to get in and open that blockage up, the more tissue in the brain that we see dying. And so what we're concerned about, ideally, we want to get people into treatment within um, 90 minutes, um, we call it door to needle time. And so we are doing our best to get them to the, the best level of care possible so that we can open up whatever blockage is occurring and get blood flow and oxygen back to the area of the brain that has been starved for lack of a better term of the, the oxygen, the nutrients it needs. And so the faster we can reverse the blockage, the faster that we can open that back up and save the brain tissue. Um, 
um, because the longer it goes on, the more tissue we see dying, and that leads to um, permanent damage. So you, you could end up with a permanent inability to move half of your body, a permanent inability to speak normally, swallow normally. So it's really critical for us to get those patients the care they need very quickly. I know that many times um, when we get ill, we go to the doctor, we think we know what it is. And we come in telling the doctor, this is what I need, this is what I need, and I want you to do this or that or whatever. So let's say, for example, you go to the doctor and you suspect that you may have um, a heart disease or something wrong with the heart. Uh, what are some of the things you can request from your provider? Uh, to assist you in determining that? That is a wonderful question. So the first thing I would say when you go to see your provider is say, I'm concerned about whatever type of heart disease it might be. So if it's, I'm concerned that I have high cholesterol or I'm concerned that I have high blood pressure, that information is really helpful to your provider to understand what they would like to continue to check. What do they need to look at, right? Um, so if it is high blood pressure, we're going to check your blood pressure when you come to the clinic either way, but we might be looking at other things in addition to your blood pressure. If it's cholesterol, then we're probably going to send, um, send you to the lab and have your blood drawn to check your cholesterol levels. Um, it's just those simple things like that. We might send you out to have, um, an, an echocardiogram or an ultrasound of your heart to, to look for abnormalities there. I mean, there's a number of procedures they might order, but it all depends on your individual situation. Okay, great. And I know you mentioned before a little bit about um, the genograms and personalized medicine and, and um, precision medicine. Mm -hmm. How important is that in determining if you have heart disease or heart failure? Interesting. Good question. Um, so that is a component um, that plays into it. I, it is a relative, like precision medicine has been around for a while, but uh, physicians utilization varies. And so some physicians may be more likely to, you know, depending on your, again, your specific situation, you, knowing you have a family history of certain conditions, they may be looking at those, um, um, sorry, <laughs> at, um, at, at your genotype and trying to understand how that factors in. Um, it, it really all depends on a case by case basis, to be honest. Okay, great. Um, again, if you have any other further questions, uh, please feel free to continue to type them in the chat or let us know, we'll be more than happy to either answer them on the air if we have time, or we will answer them um, at, our, at our social media sites when we do post the, uh, the actual presentation. Again, Allison, thank you so much for your information. It's been very helpful. And again, on behalf of all of us, I just wanna say thank you for the information. And also, if you are interested, anybody's interested in learning more about all of us, you can't get a hold of us. I'm going to skip ahead a couple of, of pages here. Here we go. Uh, these are different places to contact us. Our address is at 10,000 North 92nd. Uh, you can call us at 955-2689 or email us at all of us at mcw.edu. So to give you a little bit more information why all of us is so important is the all of us research, like I mentioned before, is a historic effort to collect and study data from 1 million people or more. We had mentioned before about heart disease. It is always good to find out where it runs in the family, if there's a history, like you mentioned, father over 55, mother over 65. You know, you have to be careful. Some of us have it in both sides of the family. Some of us don't have it at all. We could be the first one. But the only way to find out is number one, like you mentioned, is going to see your doctor. That's the important thing to make sure. And that's why sometimes we go to a doctor and they ask you all these questions. You know, did your family have this, someone in your family? And I know it's tiring sometimes to answer those questions because we don't know. I'll be honest, a lot of us don't know what our family tree has. But with the All of Us Research Program, by being part of it, 
the good thing is you do get back uh, genetic results and you're able to get an idea of what runs in your family uh, based on your genes and your DNA. And that's a service that we provide for free. So if anybody's interested in learning more about uh, all of us or precision medicine, uh, please give us a call or visit our website at joinallofus.org to get more information to be part of it. It's a great way of finding um, what runs in the family and being one step ahead of the problem. So again, thank you so much. At this moment, we're gonna go ahead. Oops, I went a little bit too far. I'm so sorry here. And I messed it up. Either way, uh, we're gonna go into our drawing right now. And, um, and I get, I, give me a quick second here. I messed up, which I normally don't do, but sometimes it happens. Uh, here we go. Uh, here we go. All right. So here is our drawing. As we mentioned before, um, everybody who attended today is eligible for the drawing for $25 cash. Um, we have checked our attendee roster, and we're going to give the initials of the person who won today. Um, in 48 hours, you will receive an email or a phone call to verify you are the winner. So once we reach out to you, you'll have two weeks to respond so we can make arrangements to get you the $25. Today's winner initials is DS. D like in David, S like in Sam, DS. So if you feel that you are the winner, and uh, there might be more than one DS, but if you are the winner, we will contact you via phone or email within the next 48 hours to inform you that you have won and to make arrangements to get that, pr that prize to you. Again, thank you for being part of everything. Um, again, we have a couple more sessions coming up. We have these out uh, twice a month. We will represent the heart disease uh, presentation again in next week, Wednesday on the 24th in Spanish. And of course, Allison will be presenting it again. We are blessed and lucky enough that Allison is bilingual. So we get to, we kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. And then in March 10th, we have, we start our series for the month of March on colon cancer. So um, after the event is done, please take a few minutes to answer a short survey and or you can email us again at all of us at mcw.edu with your suggestions or ideas for other topics. We appreciate all the ideas you can give us and all the information you can provide. Again, our contact information, we're with the Medical College of Wisconsin. We're located in the Curative Building at, 10, at 1000 North 92nd. Our phone number is 414-955-2689. Our website is all of us at mcw.edu. And we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and this presentation will be at the MCW YouTube page. And uh, that information will be given to you uh, um, as soon as it's posted. Again, thank you for your time. Allison, thank you again for your presentation. Very informative. Uh, I know I learned a lot from it, so I appreciate that. And everybody who attended, thank you for attending. And we hope to see you again in March when we talk about colon cancer. Have a great evening. Stay safe and stay healthy. Good night.